So let me see it. Where is it? Here. It's all right here in my noodle. The rest is just scribbling. Scribbling and bibbling, bibbling and scribbling. <laughs> Alfie, write it down. Just write it down. On paper. It's no use to anybody in your head. We're going the wrong way. We have to get to Berlin. Brody's this way. My diary's in Berlin. We don't need the diary, Dad. Marcus has the map. There is more in the diary than just the map. All right, Dad. Tell me. Well, he who finds the grail must face the final challenge. What final challenge? Three devices of such lethal cunning. Booby traps? Oh, yes. But I found the clues that will safely take us through in the Chronicles of St. Ansel. Well, what are they? Can't you remember? I wrote them down in my diary so that I wouldn't have to remember. Let's face it, in any major religion of the world, and even the smaller ones, there's a lot to remember, so people have a tendency to write the holy words down. This was as true in the medieval Catholic Church as anywhere, where monks would, and nuns, would have no less than seven or eight services a day, often using the same texts with different music. I can only imagine how the religious would keep track of the melodies. Perhaps this is the birth of Western notation, something along these lines. Hey, which curie are we doing? Curie 4. How's that go again? That's the one that goes, oh, Kyrie eleison. Okay. So the end result of the monk's feverish scribblings was simply a series of lines, swirls, squiggles, that show the rough contours of how the melody would go. Notice we have a set of words in Latin. This is not a Kyrie, by the way. And then above what would be known as unheightened neumes. There's really no way to determine what exact notes are being given here, but you just get shapes. These graceful lines may go back to the Egyptian notion of chironomy using hand gestures to symbolize the vagaries of musical pitch up and down. And chironomy is still used today, particularly in reference to solfege, which is a concept we'll get to eventually. But before that, here is a little bit of chironomic behavior in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But these squiggles are only going to get you so far unless you can square up with that notion of letter name pitch. So here we have the next step. Oh, by the way, these squiggles will be called neumes. That's N-E-U-M-E-S. They will eventually lead to what we call notes. And notes is that term for pitch that usually we use when we're talking about the written, the notation form of pitch. So these neumes running up and down are now aligned with a single line. And that line is a set pitch. It could be any pitch. It needs to be determined as such. Here's a way to be specific. Call that particular line G. And therefore, just above the line, any noom there would be an A, right? Because we, we do the A, B, C, D, E, F, G back to A. And anything below the line would be an F. Well, over the course of years, that gets fancier and fancier and more transmogrified until it becomes what we call a G clef or a treble clef. But as you can see, the action st 
still pretty much revolves around the uh, the line itself, all of these curly cues coming together. And as for that line, eventually four lines established in medieval times. And amongst the clefts, this little guy symbolizing a C clef. So if that C on the line, notice that space would be B, and that would be an A. And wonderfulness, this is actually the Kyrie four that those two monks were dealing with. And it was called Kyrie Eleison is Lord Have Mercy. It's from the Catholic Mass, the Latin Mass. And we'll talk about that more later, too. But it's been written down now. In a way, this is this notation is, well, it could be as much as a 1,000 years old, maybe 800 years old or so. But we can still interpret in the present day as Kyrie Eleison. Or rather, let's try it again, because notice this is one long what they call melisma, where you have the syllable extending throughout. So this would be, let's try it again. Kyrie. So here's a slightly later pneumatic notation with that stylized C clef. Here it is in more contemporary notation with a G clef. And they both actually read the same. This would be, E, G, B, A. And the notes you're looking at are called eighth notes. And they are half as long as other notes that are called quarter notes. And in music, sometimes we have times when people will, instead of playing a note, they just won't do anything. And that's known as a rest. So this is a quarter note and a quarter rest. Notice that both of these kind of notes have note heads and what are called stems. And the eighth notes have beams across, whereas the quarter notes do not. The Catholic Church stuck with their four-line staff, those parallel lines known as the staff. They kept the four-line staff until 1962, but by the later Middle Ages, certainly, most of music outside the church and to the present day has been five line staves. That's the plural of staff. As a matter of fact, there was even an experimentation with a six line staff, but that didn't go much. Evidently, five lines is about enough for human beings to take in. Equal amount, or actually sections of music, are often set apart by vertical lines called bar lines within the space called a bar or a measure. A double bar, or sometimes I call this a thin double bar, can be the end of a section of music, like a verse and a chorus in music, in popular music. The end bar, or what I call a double bar, similarly, that's the end of the piece. It's not going to go on any farther. A lot of times in music, we find there are sections of music that repeat boing, boing, boing. And so if you have this, the double bar in two dots, you go back to the either the beginning of the piece or where you see the double bar in two dots reflecting forward. So this is the backward repeat and the forward repeat. And sometimes you might have a backwards repeat going back here and a forward repeat, uh, something that's going, say, to there and then repeating to there. If you don't see one of these reflexive things, you go all the way back to the beginning of the piece. In the Middle Ages, when these things were developed, they were developed really before paper was prevalent in the West. And so you had animal parchment, animal skins used. And so you didn't want to kill any more animals than you had to. So people tried to be as efficient as possible. This actually, this note, corresponds to C. And notice it's just below the five lines. This is like an extra scaffolding down here called a ledger line. And so the C here, notice D, E, F. G, and there it is, must be the G clef. And that C is actually about the middle of a piano keyboard. A lot of keys there. 88 total, except on the Bosendorfer Grand, when you have a few more over there. And typically, you will have collections of impulses, of notes, with, with a particular uh, rhythmic structures. And to that, we want, might want to initially turn to... How about some music from Senegal on the west coast of Africa? And 
this shows a nice repetitive beat cycle of strong and weak beats. Check it out. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. One, two, three. And that would pretty much correspond to three, four times. There's a percussion. We've got a lot of percussion instruments in here. Instruments that you hit. This is music for a dance. And check it out, that one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three eventually gets kind of obscured. Because over the top, you get one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Whoa! This is a traditional music from Senegal. And once again, just because it's pretty old and traditional does not mean that it ain't complex. That music featured a lot of drums and also log drums. And believe it or not, those are two different kinds of instruments, which again, we'll talk about more as we go along. So here are some note values in three different beat cycles. And we recognize two of the note values already. We've got our quarter notes here, eighth notes, and then what's half of an eighth? A sixteenth. And notice instead of one beam across, two beams across. And so the four sixteenth notes basically equal two eighth notes basically equal one quarter note. And notice we have what's known as a time signature here. And these two measures have an equal number of beats. A beat is just a pulse, and any note can represent the beat. In this case, usually quarter notes represent the beat in music these days. Not always. But, for instance, a two-beat cycle might be boom, 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 boom. Suppose we had a a repeat sign here, just kind of yo-yo back and forth. But notice, oh, and this is a notion of a time signature here. It looks like a fraction. The numerator tells you how many beats per measure. The denominator shows you what kind of note gets the beat. What kind of note gets the beat? The one-quarter note. How many quarter notes are there? Two. And so this would be boom, 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 boom. And notice here's a 3-4. And we had a 3-4 cycle that I just mentioned off the top of my head when we were listening to that Senegal, Senegalese piece. It was a very fast tempo. Tempo is the Italian for time. It just means how fast or slow the music is. And tempo marks tend to be put above the staff at the very beginning. And we had a fast tempo of... Dum, 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 dum. But let's slow this down so we can do those 16th notes too. Dum, dum, dum. And then there's a 4-4. Four, 4-4 four. Four, four is probably the most popular beat cycle in music. Two more kind of note values and two more kinds of rests. Erase the middle of the note head and you get twice as long as a quarter note, meaning a half note. And notice, you got quarters in your pocket and occasionally you might find 50 cent pieces, right? And there is a half note rest. Notice it's a lozenge. And check it out, the difference between that and a whole note. We've cut off the stem. Oh, and by the way, stems tend to go down to the left when the notes are above this middle line. And if the notes are below the middle line, the stems tend to go up to the right. That's not easily said by a dyslexic person like me. Take it from me. And notice, uh, thank you, laughter in the peanut gallery. And then notice, this is a whole rest. Notice how similar it is to a half rest. Once again, for us dyslexic people, it might be a little tough, but sometimes I think about them as bars of soap. This one is light enough to float on that level of water, and that one's so heavy it sinks below. But notice it's different water levels. This is actually sinking from the second line from the top, and this is floating from the third line at the top, meaning the, th the third space reckoned from the bottom. And why did I so change the, my mind about reckoning top-bottom? I don't know. It's that same space. Okay, I think that's enough about rhythm for now.